Um, so habitat hedgerows connecting the dots. Liam was at the thing at the Presidio. I used the same title, connecting the dots. That's a lot of what I do. I'm an educator. I like to connect dots. Um, okay. So hedgerows have a long history. I first got interested in them in them in graduate school. And when I went to Google, I, I went to graduate school kind of late, so I could Google. And um, <laughs> I Googled hedgerows in Europe, and you know what? You get a whole lot of stuff about World War II. Um, hedgerows were hundreds of years old, in some cases eight, 900 years old, and they got in the way of finding the enemy, and they actually cut a lot of them down. Um, and they've learned the error of their ways. Now they're replanting them. Um, but they are found all over the world. Um, so I just want to put out there that I really think of it not just as hedgerows, which is a linear line, but um, islands too. So we've got corridors, islands, and then there's ladders, which are kind of a vertical hedgerow. Birds like ladders. Um, so here, this is from California Agriculture Magazine. Um, <laughs> To, to me, this is what we're striving to get away from. And um, one of the ways we do that is by having hedgerows to create corridors for wildlife. Um, so historically, hedgerows were really not thought of for the kind of wildlife we're thinking of when we think butterflies and pollinators. And um, they, were, they were used for wildlife, small wildlife that you could hunt and kill and eat. Um, and they were used for timber and firewood and basketry materials. So those have multiple um, things that you could do with them. Um, oftentimes used to enclose your animals. And a lot of hedgerows were just one species and they would do something called laying over. And so you had your plant growing straight up and you would damage it at the bottom and lay the branches over and get vertical shoots and you'd get a really dense barrier, sometimes on top of a berm. So you're trying to keep your animals in or in some cases, keep other animals out. Um, so now, although I think that it's great that we're still thinking about agricultural products in our hedgerows, fruit, flowers, basket materials, we're also thinking about things like beauty, and we're thinking a lot about how can we use those as corridors for uh, wildlife, for pollinators, and um, for pest management. So um, California hedgerows have been used increasingly on farms and in vineyards. We have a lot of them, some from Northern California. We actually have quite a lot of hedgerows there and in the Central Valley. I was very surprised. I got to the Botanic Garden in Santa Barbara four years ago, almost, and but there's not a lot of hedgerows in Southern California. And our Director of Conservation and Research is really interested in that and is doing a lot of work in agricultural systems. Uh, my interest is in gardens, though, and how we can use hedgerows in our urban environments. Um, and so there are a few things to think about. Um, one, you know, well, we have Mediterranean climate. Uh, some hedgerows are actually riparian, um, you know, right along stream beds. In the Central Valley, there's places where they've created wonderful habitat along what used to be just irrigation ditches. And um, although sometimes the frogs have too many legs there. Um, so uh, yeah, frogs are sensitive to chemicals. Um, I think a lot about structure. I was talking to somebody about this the other day, how important thorny plants are for birds uh, for, to protect them uh, when they're nesting. Um, and um, we'll deal with the composition problem now. Uh, my executive director, in all fairness, I'm going to tell you, he says you should only plant natives and food and nothing <coughs> else. He's a restoration ecologist. Um, I'm a gardener, and so I'm not a purist. I think that if you have half natives, you're doing really well. Um, and be berries and seeds for birds. Um, so beauty matters to us, too. Um, this is at uh, Frog's Leap vineyard where they like to put pretty hedgerows in because they have gardens next to the vineyards. So do gardens matter? And people do ask me this. Does it, does it really matter what we do in our gardens? Look at all that wild land we have out there. Maybe we should be more concerned with that. Um, but gardens 
gardens, in fact, do matter. Um, and this is the photograph I used to say why they matter. Um, we have covered a lot of the land with gardens. So, why hedgerows? Um, biodiversity, and in a couple minutes I'm gonna talk a bit about what biodiversity is. It's a word we throw around a lot without really understanding, I think, what it means. Um, but it includes all these other things, and you'll hear me talk a lot about insects because my background is plant-insect interactions, and I, I like insects. Um, but in fact, there are a lot of other things out there too. Um, there's our pollinators. Sarah probably knows what kind of bee this is. <laughs> Where is she? Okay. Yeah, she's around. Well, that is what bee small carpenter bee. Sweat small carpenter bee. Yeah. Anyway, um, yes, so uh, a bee, good. I'm gonna remember that next time somebody asks me, what is it? Um, soil organisms, and this always amazes me that you know, in one handful of soil, there are more organisms than all the people on this planet. It is a, that is the foundation of every garden. So when I talk about biodiversity, um, and this book by um, James Nardi, Life in the Soil, I love his book. If you want to know about soil, that's the book to get. He has a wonderful picture of his, what's a drawing of his dog contributing to the <laughs> humus, yes, in his garden. Um, okay, and birds. When I first got to the Botanic Garden, um, I guess I came with a reputation, and more than one person said, hey, I heard you're a bug person. I don't like bugs. I like birds, um, and, which was really kind of interesting to me. Um, and um, given that, so this is the biodiversity, here's another wonderful book called Evolution of the Insects uh, by David Grimaldi. And um, you can see, there's a pointer, oh, look at that. So here's arthropods, okay? That's that blue, uh, wedge there, and like we're up here somewhere, there's a little line that's, you know, vertebrates. Um, we're a very small part of biodiversity. And then here is insect diversity, and the thing that's interesting to me about this is so, uh, when you think about complete metamorphosis, this big green, um, well, it's hard to call that a wedge. Um, so that's a butterflies and beetles, the things that have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult stage. And then everything else, this little section here, uh, are things like grasshoppers and true bugs, and the, they only have partial metamorphosis, right? The, the wings develop on the outside. You never see a caterpillar with wings developing. Um, and it's interesting to us as gardeners because the feeding mechanisms are so different. So this group here may feed very differently as a larva and adult, like the caterpillar and the butterfly, whereas grasshoppers, they're just eating your plants. Um, <laughs> so here's, here's why I thought it was funny about um, the, the birds. You don't like bugs, but you like birds. But guess what? Um, this 96% of our terrestrial birds are feeding their babies arthropods. They're incredibly important. And um, I sometimes show a photograph of an oak tree, because I say, you know, there's 800 species of insects associated with oaks. Those are only the ones that are eating the oak. Every single part of the oak tree, the bark, the leaves, the stems, the acorns, um, and but really, except with a couple of exceptions that can defoliate your oaks periodically, um, what you're really noticing are birds because they're there getting food. Um, so I like to mention, because this is what I studied. When, when I say I study flower visiting insects, people often nod and go, oh, pollinators. Not pollinators. I studied those other insects that are visiting flowers, and a lot of them are attacking um, pest species, they're eating the aphids and the mealy bugs and the other things that you don't want. So things like uh, lady beetles and lace wings and parasitic wasps. Um, and uh, those actually, in the literature, you see them called natural enemies. And when I started writing about them, uh, my husband said, nobody likes enemies. You should call them garden allies. <laughs> and so that's, so that's how I think of them now, garden allies, which includes a lot of other things. Um, 
And so some of these things are predators, parasites, and parasitoids. And I always like to say basically the difference is that if you're a parasite, you're not going to kill your host or you won't have anywhere to live. Um, if you're a parasitoid, you're killing the host. Um, so that, that's a whole lecture that we're going to skip over. Um, and then we have a lot of different arthropods that can help us um, to control. You know, I've been trying to get the word pest out of my vocabulary, and I just can't do it. But I think, well, there's prey and there's predators. We need the prey out there as much as we need the predators out there. Um, but, but I'm a gardener, so there's still pests. Um, and um, however, the role of herbivorous insects, so that nobody has addressed this better so far than Doug Tallamy in his book, uh, you know, Bringing Nature Home, uh, about why we need these. The scariest talk I ever did was the American Public Garden Association to tell them why we need insects to eat our plants. Um, <laughs> and, um, but we do. And but probably my greatest triumph as an educator was a, a kindergartner burst into tears one time. I used to have a lesson that said, so, you know, our, who can name a good bug? Always in a kindergarten class, somebody says ladybug, right? And um, what do ladybugs eat? It, 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 this was Sonoma County, so the kids knew, right? Oh, they ate aphids, you know? Oh, yeah. well, is an aphid a good bug or a bad bug? Mm. You know, and there was one little girl, she burst into tears, oh my God, the ladybugs would all be dead. There would be no ladybugs. <laughs> so, um, so this is what I studied, and I'm gonna just give you a tiny bit of background on conservation biological control. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with integrated pest management, which includes all of these different things. I find it interesting that the uh, genetically engineered plants are actually um, seen as less of, a pro of, a, of an intervention than biological control, but I didn't make this chart. Somebody at Davis did. But you can use conventional pesticides. So usually you get here and go, oh, biological control, okay, that's environmentally, really, that, that's the way to go. Uh, but as you see, there are three different kinds. And uh, this guy up here, C.B. Riley, uh, I always forget his exact position. He was the head of uh, agriculture in the U.S. He's actually the father of biological control. And um, it, what happened is that we got this cottony cushion scale to attack citrus. And he was the person who said, where did that cottony cushion scale come from? And he went off to Australia. And in these days, you could do this. He just came back with a couple of bugs in his pocket, basically, <laughs> right? And he brought back this Vidalia beetle. It's related to lady beetles. And he brought back a little fly as well that isn't as cute as this little beetle. And he saved the citrus industry. And everybody said, oh, this is marvelous. Um, we, we really like this classical biological control. It's great. But we found out there were a couple of things about it. One is it's more effective in a perennial system like an orchard where he was using it. And the other thing that he didn't yet know about was something called host switching. So this little beetle finishes eating the pest that you wanted it to control. Now what's it going to eat? And so that can be a problem. And um, the other thing is it's expensive now because we're so careful about it. You go to buy an insect, it's very expensive. If you have a heritage oak tree, then maybe it's worth 80 bucks to buy a special little parasitic wasp to save it. Uh, but for most of us as gardeners, not so much. Um, augmentative biological control. Um, so this is best exemplified by people buying lady beetles. Often the convergent um, lady beetle that people collect in the Sierra and they sell all over the country. And um, I don't like you to buy lady beetles. Um, you can just grow the right plants and attract all kinds of species to your yard. And when you go to the nursery and you see those little mesh bags, you look on the floor underneath and you're gonna see all this stuff that looks like little black confetti. Those are lady beetle legs. Okay, so I know it's not, it's not really wonderful, but the other thing is this, is that you're really using those as sort of a biological pesticide. You're not expecting them to establish any kind of a population. And so again, not a super effective thing. So conservation biological control 
is the ideal thing for us as home gardeners, right? Grow the right plants, create a good habitat, stop using pesticides, and your natural enemy populations will build up. And it makes a really wonderful um, positive feedback loop. And you know, the, the less you use pesticide, the more you create habitat, the more of these uh, predators and parasitoids you get, the less you're gonna think, gee, I need to spray something. Um, So integrated pest management, I probably kind of went over this a bit because I always like to point out, somebody said, oh, you put down IPM. How could you do that? And, um, and you know what? I don't put it down. Farmers have different constraints than we do. They are growing our food, and they have to feed their families, and um, the things they're dealing with are different. Um, but we don't really have the financial concerns as gardeners. If we're having trouble with a plant, then, you know, I stopped growing hibiscus. Um, because they just, they needed attention to all of those things that like hibiscus juice, I guess. Um, so, um, so native plants, um, I do love natives. I have a lot of them uh, in my garden. And um, I was telling Phil, who has a nursery, I, I was at his nursery yesterday, and um, how many plants you can fit into a Mini Cooper. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And one of the things I like about native plants is that there are a lot of insects that only visit native plants. And so often people will say, oh, I planted lavender, and um, the, oh, I, got, I had tons of insects. You know, I planted rosemary. There were all kinds of bees there. True, but we are not trained to notice what is absent. And a lot of what is absent from exotic plants, very, very tiny. It's things that you don't even notice. Um, the first time I took my parasitoid wasp collection to uh, Bob Suparco, who's an expert on those things, he looked in my box, and these were tiny, tiny little wasps, and he said, oh, those are big, let me show you some tiny ones. <laughs> and he did, he pulled out this microscope slide, and it must have had 50 little tiny dots on it. Each one of those was a wasp, and I realized that, oh, those things I thought were dust motes floating around my plant, those were wasps. Um, so um, I like to think about how small some of these things are. So you don't have to worry about it getting stung. So um, we actually have a lot of evidence that conservation biological control um, works in agricultural systems. Um, but it isn't easy to implement. There's not a lot of money to do research here because if you're successful, there's nothing to buy. Right? You're putting, you just planted the right plants, right? You put in a hedgerow and now you don't need any of those pesticides. Um, some people don't like that. Um, <laughs> However, um, gardens are really conducive to using this as a method of pest control um, for a lot of reasons um, that I'm not going to read my slide to you, um, but I'm happy to share all this information. You don't have to write down uh, all of these. And actually, one thing, oh, I was told not to go back. Oh, you can, but it just takes a Oh, there, bit okay. Down. There's one thing I want to point out here, insurance species. Okay, because this is related to biodiversity, and um, that is the idea. So if you go out and buy one species of lady beetle, you have one species of lady beetle. And if some disease comes along, it's susceptible to, now you have no lady beetles. If you have planted a good garden and you have maybe six or seven species of lady beetles, maybe something happens to one of them, but you have the others. Or you have other insects that can fill that same ecological role. So I'd say there's a lot of other benefits to um, this idea of hedgerows and um, conservation, biological control, having to do with decomposition and soil conservation and um, reducing pesticides, which is kind of what got me into this in the first place, was please stop poisoning the planet. Just plant a garden that can survive. Um, okay, and we have actually already talked a bit about um, the case for native plants, but this is what it's based on, right, is coevolution. And the thing that's always interesting to me is how new this term really is, coevolution. Um, we all grew up with it, but it's only been around. Actually, although Ehrlich and Raven came up with this term, um, 
in, or I should say popularized it in 64, some obscure forgotten mathematician actually came up with that term a couple years beforehand. Um, so there's just a few plant families and I often get asked for lists. Do you have a list of the plants I should plant to attract uh, the right insects? And um, it's easier to think of families and then use your sense of observation to figure out which ones are gonna work for you. Um, and some of these things will work over a really broad area of California. I mean, buckwheats are wonderful. But others, I've noticed a button willow. Button willow is a wonderful plant. In the Central Valley, they put it in agricultural hedgerows. It attracts tons of wonderful beneficial insects. At the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, I rarely see insects on ours. And, um, and it's not native to Santa Barbara. It's native to the Central Valley. There's even a town called Button Willow. Um, and so I, the carrot family, um, the daisy family, and there too, you know, it's like you go and look at these different things in the Asteraceae, some of them are just swarming with insects and other things will just not have very many things visiting. And so um, I don't love to give out long lists of plants because I feel like it, it's specific to where you live, um, your situation. Um, so here's a plant that is often used, sweet alyssum. We're not invasive, it is really useful. Um, it attracts a ton of the tiny little parasitoids and little surfeit flies. Um, there's primarily uh, bee plants here in the cell. Um, we use a lot of salvia. Different salvia are attracting different bees. A lot of times it's related to the size and shape of the flower. Okay, we don't need to talk about bees a whole lot though. So I'm a really big fan of uh, areogonums of all kinds. I really love them. They look fantastic and they attract a lot of different insects. Um, uh, Ramnaceae. So I gave a talk a while ago that was national, it was a webinar, and what I learned is, oh yeah, so they don't use Ramnacy back on the East Coast like we do here. Um, and the Rose family. Lots of wonderful, um, lots of wonderful plants in the Rose family. Okay. And grasses. So here's something that is often overlooked. The importance of bunch grasses, a lot of wolf spiders, ground beetles are hanging out at the bottom. Uh, at the base of grasses, and after reading for years that lady beetles like to hibernate at the base of bunch grasses, I, uh, one warm spring day, I actually got to see lady beetles all climbing out of that bunch of grass right there, and of course I didn't have my camera on that day. That's how those things work. Um, I wanted to mention a few more. You know, willows are, because we're in a drought, are not a great thing for you to include in a hedgerow unless you happen to have a wet place. But if you do, they're amazing. And um, the strange thing is that although we think of them as wind pollinated, they produce nectar um, as well. And they are really an important early spring source. Um, and, and it could be that you just live somewhere near a riparian area. Uh, but go and look at a willow early in the spring and you will see all kinds of insects um, on it. And quail like to eat the galls that grow on the willows too. And the catkins. Okay. So corridors, islands and ladders. See, this is up in Yolo County. Um, where this was an irrigation ditch. So it's a corridor now. Um, so one thing about when we're talking about corridors, islands, and ladders is that the idea is that that surrounding matrix isn't as hospitable. And um, I, there is, uh, I have a colleague who says, I don't understand why you're talking about hedgerows in urban gardens because the whole garden should be habitat. Every single garden should be habitat. And I said, well, yes, that's true, but they're not. And one of the things it has to do with getting people to rethink what I think of as the traditional shrub border or hedges. Santa Barbara is filled with huge monoculture hedges that could be habitat, and that habitat could be connecting places. I think of it as kind of connecting the heart of the city with wild California, right? You get all your neighbors on board, you basically are creating a hedgerow that goes from in the middle of the city to wild to wildness. Um, 
So these corridors include things like um, the, the riparian area. There's something called beetle banks. I just like the name beetle banks, right? It's just a, it's just a place for beetles to hang out. And they use them a lot in agricultural systems um, in England. They have beetle banks and hedgerows, which is kind of what we're talking about uh, today mostly. And, um, but there are also islands. And then here's our, our ladders, the vertical hedgerow. Um, so corridors, um, all I want to say about this is that insects are responding to fragmentation at different scales. Sometimes very tiny insects can't go very far. And that's why it's important for us to connect habitat. On the other hand, you get to a size where you're like a dust moat, and now you're just floating on the wind. So all of a sudden that you're going over to the other side and you can actually get around. Um, so um, I'm only putting this up there to show you that there is a lot of scientific work now going on with hedgerows. When we started planting them in California, nobody really knew anything about them. It was an intuitive thing. Hey, it's got to be good to plant a row of habitat on my farm, right? Um, but since then, we have been learning all kinds of things about how hedges, and I think this is interesting, can act as barriers or can help movement. Um, so here's my, uh, a, a little bit of the science. Structural complexity in your hedge is really important. So that would be layering things, right? Having forbs and grasses, shrubs, um, thorns, uh, tr small trees. Temporal is through time, right? Making sure that you're providing fruit and um, floral resources through time. Um, okay, we talked about identity. Okay, so when I said I wanted to talk about diversity for a moment and what that really means, um, because we just think, oh yeah, well, that's a lot of species, right? Well, it's a little more than that. So when you hear the term species richness, that's the number of species that are actually present there. And it's been shown a number of times that, uh, you know, the higher the number of plant species you have, the higher the number of arthropod species. But this other thing, abundance, comes into play how many individuals of each species are present. If you have 100 species, but there's only one each of 99, that's not doing a lot for you, you know, and then all the others are just one species. Um, and um, so that is a really important thing. And then the other thing that's really important isn't just the richness and abundance, but who's there? That's a lady beetle cuba by the way. So I talked a little bit about insurance species, and so that's what they talk about, high functional group biodiversity, that you've got a lot of different species that may or may not be related that are all performing the same function. Say, mosquito eaters, right? Things that eat mosquitoes. Um, and this concept right here has become very important, is the resilience of your system that you created, right? Can it bounce back after it's been disturbed? We have a lot of fire. Shelter, food, and water. That's basically what you need to supply uh, for habitat. Shelter, food, and water. Um, Season-long resources. Here's an important one for insects. Shrubs on the windward side, hey, okay? Blocking the wind. If you're a tiny flying thing, you don't love wind. Um, and so hoverflies, which are really a great beneficial that you can bring in, um, need um, protection from wind. Bunch grasses that I mentioned are so overlooked. We already know not to be too neat, right? That's always it's so great to have permission to not be neat. Um, natural mulch, um, and Liam referred to this, you know, leave the leaf litter there. I mean, maybe you've got an apple tree and you need to deal with it. Um, or under your roses. But generally speaking, it's pretty normal to have litter, you know. We go, listen, you go out for a hike in the woods, do you ever think, yeah, boy, somebody really needs to get out here and rake. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe they haven't pruned this oak tree. Okay. So, um, right, minimize patience. Oops, look, I um, got ahead of myself. Where is it? Here's the big one, cultivate patience. Um, sometimes people are changing from a garden that had, um, the garden had all just, say, junipers and, you know, maybe a camellia bush. And now you're trying to create a habitat. It can take some patience. A lot of those predaceous insects reproduce much more slowly than, say, aphids. Um, 
aphids. They don't need males. They can, yeah, and they can pop out live birth, and they can pop out babies every five days or so when the weather's warm. This is scary. Um, so shelter includes places to reproduce. Okay. Um, and um, this shelter, oh, this was on the garden tour um, in Berkeley one day, and somebody had a lot of toad and lizard homes. In Santa Barbara, we have a lot of rocks, so we have toad and lizard homes. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was wonderful, and then, and then, and there really are, you know, toads will move in if there's a nice environment. And uh, I don't see toads as much as we used to. Um, nesting, okay. Shelter, this is lotus land, so here we are, we've got, a monoculture hedge, but we forgive it because that's an insectary garden right there. And they just put in a new one. So um, Sarah talked about insect hotels a bit. This one was at Sonoma State where I used to be. And what did we use here? Yeah, bamboo, not native, fennel stalks, elderberry stalks. We had some things drilled. And you know, there's a lot of wild habitat here and there, there really, nothing really showed up that first year. And we thought, well, it must be because there's so much wild habitat. The second year, it filled up, hey? The hotel was full, and not just bees, but there's a lot of little wasps, too, that are good wasps that we want, and other things, spiders. And um, One thing we like about something like this is there's nothing to clean. You just throw them away and refill. And um, I actually see this as a great educational tool because we just, uh, we put a bench right in front of this and you could sit on the bench and you watch all the little bees coming and going and um, it was pretty fun. Although some paper wasps built a nest underneath the bench, that wasn't so fun. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I was actually told at the university, they said, whatever you do, don't call facilities because they'll see your insect hotel and you're gonna spray the whole thing. <laughs> So I did. So food. Um, here is, we know about flowers, we know about host plants, alternate prey. Okay, so I hear this a lot about milkweed. Oh, there's other little orange aphids everywhere. Those are oleander aphids, and they actually are an exotic aphid. But if you're patient and you watch your milkweed plants, what happens is that those aphids are really, they're really host specific, right? They're hanging out only on this, we don't like oleander anyway, so. Um, so they're hanging out on oleander, and, um, but a lot of the things that are attacking them, the lady beetles, the lace wings, the surfeit flies, they're more of a generalist, uh, generalist predators and parasitoids. And so they're breeding on these, and you look at that and you can find the aphid mummies, and you can start to see all, a lot of the beneficial insects have pretty ugly looking larvae. People sometimes want to swish them. The other thing is that if you get carried away with like, oh, I'm gonna just squirt water all over these. Well, the milkweed, um, the ladybug eggs are actually just about this color and size. Okay, they're orange and the monarch eggs aren't all that different. So um, I tend to leave it alone personally. And then down here, there is actually a tiny little native bee here on this. If you know how big milkweed flowers are water. So insects are great because you don't really have to even supply them this. Insects get, uh, some insects don't even need any water, but um, they can get it just from dew. Okay. There's just a couple things I wanted to say about design, and that is that it's easy to put in a garden that creates a great habitat. It really is not that complicated, right? The right plants, the right design, I think Bart's going to talk about how to how to do that. Um, get rid of your junipers, <laughs> unless they're native. Um, so um, it can be helpful if you're if you're replacing a hedge. Sometimes you don't want like a real hodgepodge. I'm a collector, so I would be like, oh, one of this and one of that, maybe two of this. And um, but a lot of times your hedge is going to look nicer if you <laughs> just pick one backbone plant that you know does really well in your area and it's evergreen and you use about half that and then fill in with other things. Um, breath. So um, formal landscapes. Everything I've said, does it work in formal landscapes? You know, this is lotus land. 
And um, there was an article many years ago in Pacific Horticulture that said that they used um, conservation biological control. And I thought, well, right. <laughs> and so I contacted them. And Corey Wells, who is their, I think, a plant wellness manager, said, um, come on down. And I went down to visit. And he drove me all around. And they have beautiful formal gardens. Because I think a lot of us have been taught, like, yeah, to have beneficial insects. Your garden has to look kind of weedy and untidy, and then well, certainly not weedy and untidy. Um, and this is a slide he shared with me. And he said, "No, we have all kinds of insectary gardens and hedges, and um, but there, you know, it's, it's near the uh, employee parking lot and along the driveway. And they have this one that is sort of open to the public. And so I was, I have to say, I was pretty impressed. This was really eye-opening for me." You have a, a garden now that, that it, look, it has that formal look. A lot of people want their garden to look formal, but you can still practice this kind of, of pest management, right? No pesticides. And, um, and a lot of what they did was hedges. They're big, long hedges. Um, a lot of uh, Southern California native plants. And so this is lotus land as well. A fun place to visit if you're in Santa Barbara. Um, so so I'm, I'm giving you just a few plants um, that I think are important. Um, this was, oh, this was on the garden tour one year too. I thought it was fun because this oak tree completely dominates this lot. Um, and it's actually providing tremendous habitat. And that catalog oak, new growth. Okay, um, salvias, always, I always have a lot of salvias um, in my garden. Partly, I like how they smell, and um, I like the bees. And then the hummingbird sage, of course, gets hummingbirds. And do you know what hummingbirds feed their babies? Aphids. They like to feed their babies aphids. And I had a spider web outside my kitchen window um, one day, and this hummingbird kept coming up to it. It took me a while to figure out that it was picking the dead insects out. Because they use spider uh, web, too, to line their nests. But this one was picking the insects out of the spider web and taking them away. <laughs> um, Catalina cherry is um, was great bird food. Um, some people don't love these because they can reseed prolifically. Um, but the flowers also um, are providing some really good, important nectar. And I said willows, sycamore. Hummingbirds like sycamore leaf fuzz, too. That's another thing they'll use to line their nests. Um, oh, madrone. I've given up. <laughs> um, apparently, that's a real sign of being a master horticulturist if you're in the UK. You have a madrone. <laughs> I think it's a sign of being a master horticulturist here. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I know. I grow that hybrid plant, Marina, Arbutus Marina. Looks kind of like a madrone. Close enough for me. Um, this is at the, da oh, so the Davis Arboretum, is a great plant place to visit and um, they've got some good signage and see here is a, a, the, the toy on was a natural bird feeder they called it. Um, so true. Uh, Manzanita, you recognize this? Mm -hmm. Phil. <laughs> so um, this is a manzanita that you're probably not going to put into your hedgerow but it's a manzanita I really like. Um, so when you're looking at things like manzanita, um, and I think I have a Cianothus in here too, some of them are not suited to hedging. You know, they want their space. Others are going to do quite well, and that's where I rely on going to my local native plant nursery to get to get advice. You know, what should I do? Okay, snow. What's that snow flurry? I think snowball. Snowflake. Snowflake. Yeah, that one. Like so, that one does pretty well. Some of Anyway, you need, you need advice on specific varieties that are going to suit your own situation, how much sun you have, and what your soil is like. Um, um, Holodiscus um, is a great favorite. There's some really interesting insects that visit Holodiscus. Okay. Ribes of all kinds, um, fabulous. Hey, birds. 
hummingbirds. Um, there's some really cool native bees that visit uh, a lot of the ribes. From Montedendron, if you're not planning to water in the summer, okay, and that is something that you would want when you're trying to design a hedgerow, you know, how much water are you giving it? Is it next to your lawn, or is it really like off on the edge of your property where you don't want to give it any water at all by the second or third summer? Um, they're itchy. Oh, Ceanothus. Ceanothus have very small flowers and they attract a lot of uh, really, some of those invisible things we were talking about. Um, I, I can't imagine a hedgerow that did not include Ceanothus in it. Um, for myself, anyway. Um, buckwheats, areogonums, they come in such amazing varieties. Um, so I, I love them all. Some are easier than others and I th and several have been mentioned today that are um, really good. This one's really pretty in gardens, right? The, the rubescence um, comes from one of the Channel Islands. But um, honestly, I think the California fescue is probably one of the most effective. It attracts an abundance of all kinds of things. Uh, Matilla poppy, um, if you can grow them it's not just honeybees that like them, but it's popular with them. Um, coral bells. I see a lot of surfed flies on coral bells, by the way, the hoverflies. So checker bloom. Okay. okay, so just a few things that do a California poppy at the base. So this is something where, as gardeners, we're gonna do things differently than farmers. Farmers do not care what their hedgerow looks like. They're only looking for effectiveness. But if I'm planting a hedge in my garden, I want it to look pretty. And so that's where we're planting grasses <laughs> along the base and flowers and mixing in some perennials or a vine or two. Um, we, we want them to look nice as well as be effective. Um, bulbs simply because we like them. Okay. Um, and the grasses again. And so um, purple needle grass, they like to change the name on uh, this one. I think it's Stipa now. I heard some poor graduate student do a whole talk one day, he kept saying, Nacella, I'm sorry, Stipa. Nacella, I'm sorry, Stipa. Um, and so uh, fescues um, of all kinds. This was also in Berkeley where they had to take this tree down and decided to just leave it for wildlife. Um, you could certainly have a little bit of that in the hedgerow. Um, wildflowers are such important early season resources, um, especially some of the really early flowering um, ones. What can you do to connect? So you probably noticed there's one thing that this slideshow is really lacking, and that is photographs of hedgerows in people's gardens. Um, so. <laughs> I've written about this a couple of times now, um, and um, I, so I'm always using things like Facebook and LinkedIn, and and you know reaching out. Hi, you guys. I'm I'm writing an article about um, you know rethinking the traditional shrub border as as a habitat hedgerow, and I'm looking for photos. And one of these was at a national level, and I got all of these great comments from people like landscape architects back east. What a fantastic idea! You should write a book. No, I don't have any photos, but you should do this. <laughs> so, so I'm looking for photos that exemplify this approach to planting a hedge. And, um, you know, I really kind of started down this road of thinking we should do this in our gardens because not long after I'd been in Santa Barbara, I actually sent, I call it the midnight rant, I sent a big ranting email to my boss <laughs> about the hedges in Santa Barbara and how they just support no life at all. Um, it was appalling and he, he he didn't fire me, so, um, um, and so, um, and this is the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. You should all come visit. I brought you maps, so, um, and this is not what it looks like right now. This is what it looks like in the spring. Um, photo credit. So some of them are in there, and then there's a few that were not actually in there. 
and uh, I have to say a couple of those photos at the beginning of the hedgerows in Argentina or in Europe are from a very old slideshow I did long before uh, I knew, oh, I should really put photo credits in there um, from when I was at the university. So I apologize to whoever took the photos of the Argentinian hedgerows. <laughs> and um, thank you, did I have another one? No, that's it. Thank you.